Ooh, what's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike to the channel. Welcome, bike to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is B D G E. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. We're doing a little mock draft action. 2020 fantasy football mock draft. We're going to do this on the draft wizard. Completely free to use. I will link it down below. All you got to do is go over to Google, type in fantasy pros draft wizard. It's probably the best mock draft platform, in my opinion, in the industry right now, because it takes a few things into effect. You could customize it, whatever scoring you want, however many teams you want, the positions, where they're getting their, you know, you're, you're drafting against computers, which is the thing, but they use like the ADP from the expert data. So if you've ever seen fantasy pros, they put out their yearly like expert accuracy rankings where people submit their rankings weekly and in, in the off season and whatnot, like a lot of the people in the industry and they come back with the most accurate people. Um, so they use a lot of the tools from that to integrate it into here, which is, which is pretty fun. I am curious though, for those of y'all that do mock drafts at this point in this season, what is your favorite platform? Like, do you do them on Yahoo? Do, do you do them on ESPN? I know those are terrible to do them on because the rankings and ADPs are so bad. But if you're someone who drafts on those platforms, do you tend to do all the mock drafts there? I almost feel like they're not really that helpful. So just curious, drop a comment down below. Anyone who drops a comment will automatically be entered into a draft guide. Giveaway draft guide launches in two weeks from tomorrow. Season long, July 1st. Let's get this bread. 2020 fantasy football. This is what we're, fin this is what we're finna do. We're going to go 2020 season. Yep, that's redraft. We're going to go half PPR. We're going to do the snake action. We're going to go two quarterbacks, as always, because we ride. We make the wave. All right? We are making this wave of super flex. We will no longer tolerate the one quarterback analysis. It's bullshit. Quarterbacks matter. We're going to make a matter if that's the last thing we do. We're going we're, we're gonna to fucking make a matter, or we're going to die trying. So two quarterbacks, two running backs, two wide receivers, one tight end. Two regular flex spots. I do set it to two quarterback instead of super flex. If y'all happen to be curious about why I'm doing that, because uh, otherwise the drafts start getting weird and they let quarterbacks drop too late when you do it off the expert ADP rankings. Um, I realize my texts are here, so I hope you guys don't see those. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to randomize my order. I'll click randomize for my draft position. This is a 12 teamer. And I've got the six spot. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's start this mother fudge up. So we got C Mac, we got Zeke, Saquon, Michael Thomas at the four, Dalvin Cook at the five. So here's how I'm going to approach this draft. I typically don't go into drafts really with a with a set strategy or a plan, but that might be a little bit different this year. I want to piggyback off yesterday's video. So if y'all watch that, if you didn't watch it, I would highly suggest you do that. It was a Monday Q&A, but it was centered around early round draft strategy. The video's title is the number one early round draft strategy. And basically we were looking at what's the play in the first round? What's the play in the second round? Like what picks make the most sense um, no matter where you're really drafting. And the end of the day, the conclusion was that the running backs are just so much more important. They have a higher floor. They have a, a much higher ceiling, literally a week winning and league winning ce uh, ceiling compared to wide receivers who might be a little bit consistent, but actually turned out to be less consistent than the top running backs as well. The top running backs are easier to predict in terms of the ADP based on last year. And the dip off in position scarcity is just way too big in 2020 to ignore that. So we're in a good position at the 106 where, you know, Alvin Kamara is just sitting there smacking us in the face. 81 receptions, year in, year out. Still the guy there. Uh, there's no reason to think that anything that happened last year had to do with anything other than his high ankle sprain. So we're going to be happy with Alvin Kamara here, especially in a half PPR. Dalvin Cook typically wouldn't be going at the 105 there. He it would probably be Kamara and then Cook here, and then you're put in a, a weird situation. What do you do with Dalvin Cook because of the holdout stuff? Uh, we don't really have to answer that today because we don't have to we don't have to pick him. But my, my take on on it is this: it's like of course you have to be cautious because we've literally seen it happen in multiple years now. We're seeing the holdouts become a thing. Um, and the running backs, you know, we want to talk about the protests going on in the world right now. Like the running backs are rightfully protesting as well. Like they have a real fucking bone to pick because their bodies, their bones and their bodies are getting fucking picked out by the time their fourth year of their, their rookie contract comes in. Nobody wants them. So they get chewed up, they get spit out and uh, they're feeling some types of ways about it. So 
will Dalvin Cook hold out? The, the problem with uh, like analysis on any of this is that you're never going to fucking know. Each person is so subjective to who they are, right? If, unless you know them personally, you have no idea what the fuck they're going to do. You could analyze the contracts and stuff, but you're never really going to know unless you know the person. The problem with a lot of these players is not, not the problem, but a lot of them have a lot of pride, Right. So you always hear in these negotiations, I want to be the highest paid player at running back. Like, can not you just not do that? Do you have to be the highest paid player? Can't you just like get a really nice fucking contract and not use those words? I feel like contract negotiations would go a lot better if you didn't feel like you needed to get paid Christian McCaffrey money. The reason I'm hopeful on Dalvin Cook, the reason I am hopeful is because we've already seen reports saying that from Dalvin Cook's side, they would be happy with a, you know X number of dollars per year. I think it was like 12 or 13. The, the actual money itself is not what's positive, in my opinion. The actual terminology saying that they'd be happy to settle with something there tells me that they're willing to negotiate. Where some players, they use that terminology. They're like, I want to be the highest paid player or else they're not really going to sign that contract. You know what I mean? Like that already puts the player and the teams at an uneven playing field and there's animosity between the two of the sides. So that's what scares me. That's what doesn't scare me about Dalvin Cook. So if I had to lean one way, I think we do see Dalvin Cook on the field. I also think that they have some good running backs in Minnesota. Like we've seen Alexander Madison be good on an NFL field. Mike Boone had the two games at the end of last year, busted the first game when everybody wanted to play him. Then no one played him. And then he went out and went fucking nuts on the field. So, I mean, obviously they're not Dalvin Cook, but I think I don't know. I think both sides have some leverage. I do think they get a deal done. I am hopeful that it happens, but we don't have to worry about that right now. I just wanted to give you guys my take on Dalvin Cook because that's obviously a pressing matter in fantasy foosball. Alvin Kamara, 106. Easy, easy swipe right there. Let's get his bread. So when I was saying piggybacking off of last year, uh, again, this is super flex, so you're seeing quarterbacks go pretty early. I will be targeting running backs early, and I will be targeting them often. Um, and when I mean early, I mean really early. So it's, it's becoming because you guys listen to me and I draft with you guys on drafters, like the best ball platform, even at like the 206 or 207, I'm having trouble getting a second running back as crazy. That's as crazy as that sounds. I'm having a lot of trouble getting a second running back here because everybody is stacking up the running back position. But I talked about yesterday how I want my first two running backs primarily in the first two rounds, as long as I think that they're in that like top tier. And let's look at who we got left. I drafted players. Bitch, I don't want your fucking tears. So we're sitting here, and I could grab Kyler Murray as my quarterback one. This is super flex. There's Julio Jones. There's Chris Godwin. There's Kenny Galladay. There's Mike Evans. There's even Travis Kelsey, which I think is a fucking pretty good pick here at the two. What are we at? The 209 or something like that. I like Jacobs a lot here. He's going to be a top 10 pick for me, probably a top 12 pick for me. Uh, as my running back, too, I know there are obviously concerns with the pass catchers. They bring in Limboden. They re-sign Jalen Richard. They bring in, nope, Frederick. Can't be calling me during uh, during video recording session, sir. Don't you know studio is in session? In session. Taking these motherfuckers to school. So Josh Jacobs in the second round. Here, here's, here's like the overarching theme to why we need to grab these running backs early. Most of the time when you're on the clock, you could look at who's on the board and you could say, the value pick here is absolutely like Julio Jones or the value pick here. I would say there's probably Kyler, Julio, Kelsey are probably all better value picks than Josh Jacobs or whoever, whoever you personally like at the top of the running back list there, I would say are better value picks. We have to tailor our mindset to start thinking differently because for this year, the running back drop off is so significant going into the third round that if you only picked based on value-based drafting, you're going to look back in the seventh round and be like, oh, fuck. All I did was take five wide receivers, a tight end, and a quarterback. I have no running backs. You might pick the the most fucking, the value, the valuist, the most valuable fucking team in the first 10 rounds. And guess what? You're not going to have running backs. That's the problem. There's value at other positions, but the fact that there is value means that there's a lot of depth behind it. So the position scarcity at running back is very, 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 very scurry if you do not hammer it early so you're going to end up with a team if you ju if you just draft based on value looking back and being like fuck but i didn't get guys to fill out the positions that matter the most so we're going to grab our running back here our running back two here and we're pretty set at the top heavy running back guys because here's the thing like look at the list of running backs left right now it is fucking ugly todd Gurley, leonard fournette chris carson melvin gordon Le'Veon bell jonathan taylor like listen i like a lot of these guys 
but not in the third round. Like, okay, the only one that I that you guys could probably make an argument for would be Fournette, and I, you know I'm very, very much opposed to that, but the rest of these guys are like fourth, fifth round picks, in my opinion, at best. But when you flip over to the wide receiver now, like had you taken Julio, you're going to feel really shitty about that running back two spot because you still have guys like Allen Robinson, Cooper, Odell, Juju, DJ Moore, guys that are going to be falling into the fourth, fifth rounds. Like George Kittle is here. So... When we're in the third round here, this is probably when I could be targeting a quarterback. My quarterback won. Um, there's so much good value at wide receiver. I love DJ Moore. He is my highest ranked guy. It, I, I think it depends on, you know, I've been so in tune with like the, the people on Twitter and the guys that they like. So I, in my head, I'm almost drafting according to where I think the guys that the, the analysts like at their ADP, but most of y'all play with your friends and your family. And most of the leagues that I'm in are with, are with my friends and my family and the people that are in the audience as well. If y'all want to get into a dynasty startup league, make sure you join the discord channel completely free to join. We got startup leagues fucking popping off left and right. Um, so my actual initial thought here is probably to take George Kittle. I don't know if I like using an early round pick on a tight end, to be honest. I kind of like the idea of stacking two lower guys. But we got our two running backs, and we don't really have to worry about hammering the position. I kind of like Chris Carson at the end of He's the only one I'm starting to be like semi-okay with at the end of the third round. But I think there are probably too many good players still on the board right now. So I think the drop off from Kittle to someone else, especially like I like Andrews a lot, and I think he's probably the right pick at tight end three. But in terms of volume, like the, the receptions are what really separates tight ends, especially towards the top. If you play in tight end premium, you're looking for guys that have a ton of receptions. George Kittle had, I, I believe, 85 receptions in 14 games last year. So he's going to be teetering on that like 90 to 100 reception mark this year. I think he gives you a monster positional advantage at tight end. In the third round, I think that's a really good value pick. Um, not even a value pick, just like a high upside pick. And I think when you look at the other positions, there's not going to be a tier drop off at wide receiver or at quarterback like there will be from George Kittle to the next tight end. So I'm actually going to hit the hammer on fucking Georgie K. Let's draft him. Let's take a look at the draft board. How we looking? So there goes the wide receiver run. Maybe I should have fucking slammed the hammer down on that. We have not taken a quarterback yet, uh, but we see there wasn't a big quarterback run, luckily. So this is probably where I'd be taking to shore. This is where I'd be looking to shore up my quarterback situation. Now, I will say a few things in super flex leagues. I know that the team over here has been wildly trying to convince y'all to flip your leagues over to super flex leagues because one, it just opens up the trade engagement within your league a ton. You know, it makes quarterbacks matter. It makes a lot of things more fun. Um, secondly, it makes the draft more interesting. It just it, it just it improves every part of your league. With that being said, since a lot of you guys are going to be new, I will like to throw out some hopefully helpful tips to you when you're drafting in a super flex league there are a few things you need to consider and they are subjective to your league type the smaller your league is the less valuable these quarterbacks become because you're going to be able to get them later in the draft some if you're in an eight team or a 10 team league even in 10 team leagues you're going to be able to find starting quarterbacks probably on the waiver wire they're not ideal you don't want them but you will be able to find them as opposed to a 12 or 14 team league Superflex, you're not going to be able to find if your quarterback gets hurt, you're not going to be able to pick up a Nick Foles or a Derek Carr, whoever some of the lower tiered ranked guys off the waiver wire. So the 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 smaller your league is, I say the less you really need to worry about the quarterbacks and I would stack up the skill positions. Don't fade the, the position completely, but the less you have to worry about it. I also think full PPR makes quarterbacks a little bit less valuable because the reason you want that quarterback in your super flex spot, you know, you want to be starting two quarterbacks, of course, is because the floor of any starting quarterback is way higher than the floor of any other position, right? Um, the quarterback, you know, 18 on a given week is probably going to put up 13 or 14 points at, at, at a minimum, right? Most likely you're probably going to see between 15 and 16, whereas whoever is your, you know, at this point, if it's your super flex spot, you already have your two starting running backs in the lineup. You already have your two starting wide receivers. You already have your two regular flex plays. So you're basically going on to your fifth or sixth flex play to insert into that super flex spot. So the drop off between a quarterback two and like your fifth flex play on your roster is going to be big. But in PPR, 
I would argue that gap's not that big. So if you're, if your fifth flex spot is like a wide receiver too, it's like a Jarvis Landry or like even like a Michael Gallup or Julian Edelman, one of these guys down here, you could probably pretty reasonably project them to put up, you know, 10 PPR points. That's not outrageous. That's five catches for 50 yards. Whereas that 10 to 14 gap from the quarterback too is not that wide anymore. Um, but in a half PPR, that might be like, you might only get like six or seven points out of those guys. So the gap is much wider. So I would say the two things to really understand in your league is if you're in full PPR, the second super flex spot is not as valuable. It's still obviously valuable. You still want a good quarterback there, but I wouldn't go crazy and start jumping the gun on quarterbacks who are not being picked that value. And, uh, in terms of like scoring settings for the quarterbacks, I don't think that changes anything relative to the other positions so if a quarter if your league setting is six point per passing touchdown that doesn't necessarily mean that quarterbacks become more valuable it means that the passing quarterbacks become more valuable so you'd adjust your positional rankings right you'd adjust the rankings within just the quarterback realm um, you know, you like a guy like Matt Ryan a little bit more than maybe you would like a guy like uh, Ryan Tannehill now because we expect Matt Ryan to throw a lot of passing touchdowns, but we expect Ryan Tannehill's value to come at least more from the rushing side than a guy like Matt Ryan. Um, if it's four point per passing touchdown, obviously you have a little bit more of a value boost in the guys like Tannehill or Joe Burrow or the guys that do run a little bit. Um, so just keep that in mind when you are drafting. So here we have some, we still have some really good players available. I mean, I talked about, like we faded wide receiver and this is why you do it because look at the top five receivers on the board still after having Alvin Kamara, Josh Jacobs as your running back one, running back two, George Kittle as your tight end one, we could still get Cooper cup, AJ Brown, Calvin Ridley, Robert Woods, um, even like all the way down to Devonte Parker, Tyler Lockett, DJ Chark, Terry McLaurin, like not the most ideal, but definitely not upset about having any of those guys as your wide receiver one, when you have the other power, in the uh, you have so much firepower in the other positions because again we know that go going back to yesterday's video the production like the replacement value from the top end wide receivers down to you know like tie uh, like wide receiver seven down to wide receiver 17 in terms of points per game is not that big of a drop off so having someone who's not that elite in your wide receiver one spot is really not that big of a deal so i might fade wide receiver again here and grab our first quarterback or we could play it risky. I do like Matt Ryan. I think like Matt Ryan and Carson Wentz are probably in a little bit of a tier of their own here. Um, I don't even remember the scoring settings for this league. We'll we'll assume it's four point per passing touchdown. And I think I'm going to go with Wentz here. I like Tom Brady too. If it was six points per passing touchdown, I would think of Brady or Matt Ryan. But we'll anchor our team with Carson Wentz here as the quarterback one. And we see a little bit of that wide receiver run, but no one else. So I'm still feeling pretty good. We can grab our second quarterback, but there are so many on the board that I'm pretty comfortable starting. The way I look at Superflex and redraft, at least, is think about like who you'd be comfortable starting in a, in a one quarterback league. Who's the last guy on this list that you'd be like, OK, I, I could stream Gardner Minshew. Like he's someone that I'd be like, OK, you know, I'm not going to be pissed about if he's my quarterback one. That's the way I look at it for Superflex, except for as the quarterback, two. So we have our first guy. I'm feeling good about Wentz. And I think I could probably fade the quarterback position as my second one and finally grab my first wide receiver. So the way I look at it, y'all know I love Terry McLaurin. I love DJ Chark. I love both those guys. But since we faded wide receiver, I would probably rather go with someone who's extremely consistent at the position that I know is going to get me a solid, you know, 10 points a week, possible blow up games. And for me, that looks like Robert Woods right here. Um, a lot of good options still on the board. Again, this is why you fade fucking wide receiver early. Grab your running backs because they're the tier drop off at running back is just so 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 ugly. I know some of you guys would like James Conner, but I'm just I'm just I'm just I'm just okay on running backs for right now. So we're gonna go with Robert Woods. It's wide receiver one. He played like a legit wide receiver one at the end of last year. I mean, once they started going more two tight end sets, it was Rob Robert Woods is a versatile player who he's not. You know, if they do go twelve personnel for this year. And that's a possibility because their offensive line is not good at blocking. You throw an extra tight end in there to kind of short things up. Robert Woods is the one who will not suffer. I tweeted this out um, the other day. I don't know, remember if I put it in a, a video or not, but I'll bring it back up for you guys. Make sure you're following me at Nick underscore BDGE. Okay, so this was the point I was pretty much making. Adam Thielen and Cooper Cup. Two widely viewed slot wide receivers who off whose offenses might see heavy doses of 12 personnel. So two tight ends, forcing them to play outside far more often. Over the last two years, you look at Adam Thielen versus Cooper Cup. Thielen 
is sort of like Robert Woods, where he is versatile, much more versatile than he gets credit for. And uh, he's actually, the numbers say he's better outside than he is in the slot. Cooper Cup is a slot wide receiver. So in the second tweet of this thread, you could see, I'd gladly take both of them at their current ADPs of late fourth, early fifth rounds. One of them is a great slot wide receiver. The other is a great wide receiver that happened to play slot. So that's what I'm talking about with Thielen versus Cup. So Robert Woods kind of fits that Thielen mode where um, he's not going to be the one that suffers from them going into two tight end sets. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think Cooper Cup is the one that's going to have a little bit of trouble. And it makes sense just given like his his profile. If you look at uh, Cooper Cup athletically, he's more of like a smart player that loves to read the zones, really good at finding the zones, a really good possession receiver, but... Um, it makes sense why he might struggle or at least be a little bit less effective on the outside because he's just not athletically gifted and doesn't have the speed and the burst to separate from, you know, outside cornerback one. So if that is a concern, if you legitimately think they're going to go to more two tight end sets, which I think is very reasonable, then Robert Woods is probably the play there at uh, around later in ADP. So we get to the where are we at, though, sixth round at the 607. And right now the team is Kamara, Jacobs, George Kittle, Carson Wentz, Robert Woods. So we got our tight end. Feeling good about that. We've got our QB one. This might be where I think about taking my second quarterback. Like it would be nice to have a a really solid pair behind uh, behind Wentz. Um, Ryan Tannehill's nice. You pair Jared Goff with Robert Woods. I don't hate. I like Joe Burrow. So there's a lot of options I still kind of like. So I'll probably fade the position right there. Um, Running back, yeah. I mean, again, the value just drops off when there's so much value here at wide receiver. So Lockett, I like. DJ Chark, I like. Terry McLaurin. And again, I might just try to go with more consistency here at wide receiver given the fact that I did fade for so long and you want to make sure that you're getting your 8 to 10 points a game from all those wide receivers and let the running backs really win the weeks for you. Though I, I think most of the time when I'm at the later rounds in the sixth round of drafts, and I don't expect these guys to be here, but I, I think I like DJ Chark and Terry McLaurin about equally. At an equal level. My love for them is infatuous. I just straight up make up words on mock drafts. Doesn't make any fucking sense. Um, so I would probably be just swapping between. Like if I was in five leagues, I would take like McLaurin at the in the in the end of the six and three of them. DJ Chark and the other other two. Again, I always say diversify the revenue, man. Like you can love a player. Like I love Terry, but I ain't blind to the red flags to the fact that Dwayne Haskins is his quarterback, and if he has a fucking infamous flame out then Terry McLaurin's stock, is, his stonks ain't going to be looking fucking good. So I'm not going to be drafting Terry McLaurin in every league when I also love a guy like DJ Chark here. So uh, just for the sake of what the fuck I'm saying, I'll go with Chark over McLaurin. Next time I'd go with McLaurin over Chark, though, just to diversify the living you. So let's see what happened on the draft board after this. So we had Tyler Lockett, DeAndre Swift, AJ Green, Baker, Zach Ertz, DK Metcalf, T.Y. Hilton, Evan Ingram, Terry. Ooh, I almost got Terry on the back burner. Okay, this is probably where I would look to grab the quarterback because if there's another quarterback run after this and it gets down to the point where it's a couple guys that I do not like and I'm not comfortable starting, then you put yourself in a super vulnerable position, especially in a 12-team league. I mean, there definitely are some, some players that I still like on the board. Like, I would love to have Hollywood Brown as a as a flex, even Tyler Boyd I like as a fl- as the first flex. Um, Rohim Mostert, I know a lot of people like him way more than I do. Cam Akers, I I don't hate either. I I still think there are probably red flags. So I will I'll take like the the I think the right pick here is quarterback. It's not the exciting pick, but I do think it is the correct pick. And between Goff and Ryan Tannehill, I'll probably go Tannehill here, just for the fudge of it. Mm-mm. Yep, there goes like every player I kind of wanted. So after Tannehill, we shored up our second quarterback spot. And now I'm feeling really good about our starting lineup, though. Uh, we have safety and Robert Woods as wide receiver one. And then we have a lot of upside in DJ Chark. What I love about DJ Chark is, one, he was just fucking awesome last year. Like it was his first legit year as the outside wide receiver there. Goes over 1,000 yards. And now we're looking at Jay Gruden coming in as the OC, and I've talked about this many times, but I, I think DJ Chark reminds me a lot of AJ Green. And Jay Gruden was the OC in Cincinnati 
the first three for three years. And those were the first three years that AJ Green was in the league. And he took over as that alpha outside. And I think we're going to see a lot of comparisons between the two of them. And DJ Tark was very good with Minshew under center. Uh, Minshew was surprisingly one of the most accurate deep passers last year. I believe he was the, the single most accurate deep passer per PFF, uh, really high grades, had zero interceptable passes on, I think, 45 deep attempts or something like that. And that's where DJ Chark absolutely uh, excels. So I like DJ Chark's upside. I think he legit has like 13 to 1400 yard upside in the offense this year. Um, so obviously we have Kamara and Jacobs as our RB1, RB2. And let's let's take a minute to just sit back, relax, look at what's on the board here. So it's getting a little bit ugly at most positions to say that lightly. I would honestly think about grabbing a third quarterback here. If this was a real draft, I might do that, but we'll probably do something a little bit more exciting. A lot of y'all like Marvin Jones. I don't really know if I want to buy into him in a redraft, to be honest. I feel like he's getting older there, coming off the injuries. Matt Stafford, a little bit banged up, though Dr. Morse is not concerned about him. Um, Dr. Morse is doing a lot of good work over at the Fantasy Doctors, and he's doing his own entire injury guide where he does a breakup or a synopsis, a big write-up of every possible injured player going into 2020. Um, how he, you know, he breaks down the injury that they had, the possible risk of re-injuring, and then he gives you a rating, a 1 to 10 rating, which is quick if you don't want to read that shit, if you're getting lazy like myself, of uh, the injury factor going into 2020. Like, how nervous should we be about this player? Just 1 to 10. That will be in the draft guide. That will be in my draft guide. So he's putting that in the Big Dogs draft guide as well, which y'all can get for free if you just go sign up on monkeyknifefight.com and you use the promo code BDGE when you deposit 10 bucks. You'll get to play with $20 on Monkey Knife Fight if you do that. Plus, you'll get access to our season-long guide, the Big Dog's Rookie and Dynasty Guide, and Dr. Morse's Injury Guide. It's the best fucking value in all of fantasy football. Hands down, I promise you that. Big facts. I would never lie to y'all. Just sometimes. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I kinda, Dude, I kind of like Christian Kirk this year a lot more than... He, he, I don't think he's getting the credit that he deserves for what the upside could look like in that offense. Like, I feel like we're forgetting that Christian Kirk had... Um, an insane amount of targets last year. Like, he only played in 13 games. He had 108 targets. That's on pace for almost... I, I'm not fucking good at math right now off the rip, but let me let me bring out the TI-83. Shouts out to TI-83. 108 divided by 13. 8,800. 8.3 per game times 16. You're looking at 133 targets. Obviously, DeAndre Hopkins is coming over there as the alpha, and he should command close to 130 to 140 targets. But this is an offense that just goes four wide receiver sets all day and tomorrow, and Christian Kirk is ascended to the wide receiver two in this role, and maybe he's going to be better with a clear alpha on the outside because Kirk is a guy who's explosive. He could run short routes and then take the ball deep with it in his hands, good with the yak. He's also explosive downfield and getting the cornerback two while Hopkins occupies the first guy. I like I like Christian Kirk as a really good value play. I think he's someone that will give you, you know, those six to seven targets a week and, and give you games where he goes, you know, six or 75 in a touchdown. And you love that as your flex one. So I don't hate Christian Kirk here. Um, looking at the running backs, guys that are a little bit exciting with some like upside, but I feel like most of these guys down here have a pretty high bust rate. Um, and Alexander Madison, what are my thoughts on him? I mean, you know my thoughts on Dalvin Cook. I went over them earlier on. So if you do have Dalvin Cook, I think like taking a guy like Madison in the 8th, ninth, 10th round does make a little bit of sense because um, you're only shooting for upside at, at this point in the draft anyways. You're shooting for guys that have a high bust rate. So you're like a little bit nervous about them anyways. I, I guess Alexander Madison gives you some insurance. I'm not against dr uh, drafting handcuffs that are in like these extreme types of situations because it's a very realistic possibility that cook does end up holding out so we'll go with christian kirk here for some more stability at the flex spot i would have liked to have gone with darius geist get a little bit of upside there i think these two guys right here philip Lindsay and matt braid are still like extremely underrated uh, for what they're going to do this year. I don't know if I want to grab them in the ninth round, though. It's a little bit early when there are still starting quarterbacks on the board. Yeah, we're going to grab a starting quarterback here. Um, and since we already have... Who do we have at quarterback? We have 
Carson Wentz, Ryan Tannehill. Uh, yeah, those are week in, week in starters. I'm I'm probably going to go with Gardner Mitchell here. Stack it with DJ Chark. The reason being, uh, Drew Locke is exciting here, and he probably would be the right pick, but he just offers nothing on the ground. And at this point in the draft, when you're looking for upside, like in order for a, a fantasy quarterback to be like really relevant in a given season that doesn't put up rushing numbers, he has to be like really, really fucking good through the air. And I'm not. I'd rather. I'd rather let Drew Locke do that first and then have to pay up for the price next year once we've seen him do it through the air, then pass on a guy like Minchie or even Teddy Bridgewater I like down here a lot, actually. Even Tyrod Taylor, too. Uh, pass on a guy that we haven't seen do it. And Gardner Minchie is a guy who we have seen be successful. I mean, 21 to 6 touchdown intercept, interception ratio is rookie year. 300 and something rushing yards. And looking at his rushing numbers, and this is a, something I'll touch on in a video coming out soon about Gardner the number of rushing attempts that he had, uh, any quarterback that had that same number of attempts last year had a minimum of four rushing touchdowns. So we should see it was like four, seven, nine, and seven. The four guys that had more rushing attempts than him, those are the touchdown numbers from those quarterbacks. So we should see a minimum of three rushing touchdowns from Gardner this year if he keeps that um, that run and gun mentality, which I believe he will. So we'll go with Gardner Minshew as our quarterback three, and we're set in our super flex league now at quarterbacks. We won't have to worry about that for the year. Now let's look at some running backs. To get some wide receivers. Looking at our second flex play. I don't even hate Jared. I feel like Jared Cook is going so far under the radar as well. Uh, Deontay Johnson is a guy that I absolutely love. And he started to go super, super fucking early. Like the whole entire fucking industry loves Deontay Johnson. So I imagine by like September uh, and late August, he's going to be like an eighth round pick. And that I cannot get on board for. But in the 10th round, I really don't hate um Deontay Johnson here. I don't hate Philip Lindsay, man. I, I, I've been vocal about this. I think Lindsay, as a pure runner, is about as good as uh, Melvin Gordon at this point and probably better. I mean, dude, he's undrafted free agent. The guy goes for 1,000 yards in both of his first two seasons. It's not like he's washed up. He's not fucking old. He's just a pure, good fucking runner. And this is an offense with a very underrated run blocking line. This is an offense uh, that brought in a lot of weapons. This fucking, you know, they, their defenses are going to have to be on their toes at all points. So, Philip Lindsay, I, I feel like if he plays a little bit more of a satellite role, though Melvin Gordon will probably get a ton of catches, I think Philip Lindsay will end the season with probably around, you know, 900 to 1,000 yards from scrimmage. And to get that in the 10th round, I think is incredible. So, I'm actually going to smash the button on Philip Lindsay and hope that Deontay Johnson gets back to me in the 11th. Hey, let's fucking go. So we got Deontay Johnson, high upside, wide receiver bench stash spot. You know, if we go into the year, here's what can happen. Deontay Johnson, is. this is why, because you could see it playing out either way. He could be the number one outside wide receiver there in Pittsburgh with Big Ben coming back, and you smash that pick. You could also see a scenario in which um, Deontay Johnson takes a step back, not takes a step back, but... Uh, sorry, I got distracted outside and someone was walking by. Um, you could see a scenario in which, I don't know, he's a 60 to 70% snap guy, sharing snaps with James Washington, sharing snaps with Chase Claypool, comes out of the gate with like a 5 for 50 game, then a 3 for 34, maybe like a 6 for 90 game. or so. It just, you know, you could see a ton of inconsistency and never feeling comfortable putting Deontay Johnson in there. That's absolutely in the range of outcomes. I do think he's super talented. Over the, the last month of last year, he was commanding targets at like an unbelievable pace. I believe he was above the 30% target share for the last month of the season. I would love to see that kind of roll into this year. Although, new quarterback, like a lot of changes going on there in Pittsburgh between them bringing in Chase Claypool, bringing in Eric Ebron, we don't know how it's going to turn out. So to start reaching for Johnson on the fact that like you hope he breaks out is is not a strategy I suggest. Although you know we love we all love the player, but I, I sometimes the value starts to get sucked out of the player. So I'm glad we got Deontay Johnson in the 11th round. Now is pro I would probably take Alexander Madison straight up here. Um, some of the wide receivers I like. I love Deshaun Jackson too. I really, really like Deshaun Jackson. I'm I'm more than willing. Same analysis that went into last year, I would be putting into this year. Um, he had that hip injury, and we know what Dr. Morris he said as soon as he had it in the first week, he's like, This is a, an injury that he needs to get surgery, uh, recover for like six weeks, and then he'll be fine. He chose not to do that, and that's why he missed so much time, kept re injuring it. He had the surgery this offseason, and he should be ready to roll. Uh, come week one. So Deion, uh, Deshaun Jackson has obviously had trouble, but we saw what he did in his 
trouble staying on the field, but we saw what he did in week one. And I actually, I think this is a smash spot for me to pick him here in the 12th round because I already have Carson Wentz. If Deshaun Jackson could stay healthy, I think he will operate as a, as the, uh, as a top wide receiver. And we actually saw, I believe a report. I was thinking about this before I saw this report too, which kind of pissed me off, but we saw the report about Deshaun Jackson coming out last week or two weeks ago. Deshaun Jackson is expected to be the Eagles top receiving threat in 2020. Obviously that hinges on his, um, him remaining healthy, but it's a massive boost, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, I agree, man. I, I think that Deshaun Jackson will be fine if he could stay on the field. That's a big if, but you're getting him in the 12th round, so the upside is massive there. And the fact that I compare him with Wentz on my team already is beautiful because as like your flex, your second flex spot to get games where he might go for 25 points to pair that with your quarterback, oof, oof, I'm chubbed. I'm chubbed up. So we get Deshaun. I'll probably start to look for a backup tight end right now, even though I have kill. I don't know. The tight end spot is just so ugly, typically. And if something goes wrong, you don't want to end up having to stream someone like fucking Ian Thomas or Chris Hearn, even though I like both those guys. But you know what I'm saying? Um, you don't want like a two spot in that in that part of your lineup. So at this point, there's not a lot of value left pretty much anywhere on the board. I do love Anthony McFarland. Y'all know that. We're in the 13th round. Yeah, so we got three more rounds, and the team is made up. Let's see what my team looks like. Rosters on the left side. So we've got Carson Wentz, Ryan Tannehill, Alvin Kamara, Josh Jacobs, Robert Woods, DJ Chark, George Kill, Christian Kirk, Philip Lindsay, Garner Minshew, Deontay Johnson, Deshaun Jackson. So I'm going to go back after the draft as soon as I you know, finish up the 15 rounds and look and see what I would do differently. And kind of talk y'all through that. Um, right now, I'll probably take my second tight end. I like I like Dallas Goddard here. Uh, w- the reason I would take Goddard over Gasicki or Hawkinson is because we have Kittle, and I just assume Kittle is going to be a week in, week out, every play. You know, you're, you're never going to have to take him out of your lineup. So grabbing a guy like Hawkinson or Gasicki, I feel like is kind of uh, a waste because they'll be like a steady, you know, seven to eight point producer probably week over week. Goddard, on the other hand, he's one that has, you know, if something were to happen to Ertz, he has legit, like, I, you, if something happens to Ertz, you're putting Goddard in your second flex spot. Like, in, without a doubt, he's, uh, you know, he becomes a top five tight end, and you feel good about having him in your flex spot. So, I like Goddard there as kind of a stash on the bench because of the upside, and I'm not going to have to depend on him ever being in my lineup. Um, here, again, I'm when you get into later rounds, I am just shooting for upside. I'm shooting for straight upside because you, you don't need floor. You, having floor on your bench does nothing. Having a ceiling on your bench, if it hits, then you could use that motherfucker. So I'm going to go with a guy like Anthony McFarland. Like I said, he's explosive. Um, he's bigger than I thought he would be. He brings an element to this backfield that James Conner does not. James Conner is also someone who just can't get fucking rid of his injuries. So like McFarland there because of the upside, it is fucking real. And we come to our last pick. Our last pick. Who is Mr. Unfortunate? I kind of like Golden Tate here. I kind of like Michael Pittman here too. Um Probably go with one of those wide receivers. Golden State was like sneaky, really, 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 really good. And I, I, I you know, Sterling Shepard's had so many concussions. Evan Ingram is coming off a Liz Frank injury where he had surgery in February. So I'm like, I'm very weary of, of Evan Ingram. It's the same injury that Hollywood Brown had. And that's why he missed the combine around the same time span. And he had to play with a, a screw in his foot for the entire year, which is kind of what fucked him up. So that's the same thing Evan Ingram's dealing with. So I feel like, between all these guys on this team. And Darius Slayton's like, you know, a good role player, a good deep threat guy. Um, I still think Golden Tate's probably going to be the apple of Daniel Jones's eye. So I like Golden Tate here, man. I know I just said, like, don't draft for floor, but I feel like Golden Tate's not just like a floor play. Like, he's someone that you could legitimately, I think, put in your lineup week over week and feel decent about. So we'll go with Golden Tate as our last pick here. And then we'll go back to the draft board because I'll be honest, man, looking at my team now, um, you do hope to have stronger flex plays than guys like Christian Kirk, Philip Lindsay, though. Like, I think the bench kind of gives you, you know, if Deshaun Jackson's on the field, I'll probably play him over these guys in the flex spot. Deontay Johnson, if he breaks out, then you're feeling pretty good. The rest of the starting lineup looks good. Where I would probably have gone differently is the Ryan Tannehill pick. You know, I talked about how I liked a lot of the guys. Like if you look two rounds later, I could have got Joe Burrow around later. I could have got Jared Goff, Kirk Cousins, Gardner Minshew, instead of my quarterback three, he would have been my quarterback two. But one of my flex plays could have been, which way is this going? 705. Seven, okay. So I could have had Landry, Boyd, Marquise Brown, even like a Cam Akers, you know, you like. 
uh, as my first flex play rather than having Tannehill as the quarterback too. And I would have felt a lot better about my starting lineup there. So it's about reading your league. It's about knowing when those quarterback runs are going to run off the board. Sometimes quarterbacks are just overvalued, man. Sometimes they go off extremely early and then you have to fade that and hope that uh, you do land one of these guys later on. Like worst case scenario, you got Sam Darnold down here in the 10th round as your quarterback too. Uh, the, the points per game difference between the quarterback 10 and the quarterback 18 is really not that massive of a difference. But the difference between having um, who was my flex, my second flex spot, like Philip Lindsay, who could end up just not being very involved in this offense with Melvin Gordon the difference between having, you know, a Marquise Brown or a Tyler Boyd to a Philip Lindsay could be the difference maker in your lineup. Um, a lot of ifs, a lot of fucking loose ends of tie up there, but I think y'all get the point. If I, if I, I like the team, I really like the team overall. Like the, the first, I would say six rounds, I think are fucking pretty flawless there. But the Tannehill pick is the one that I would take back if I could. And I would probably go with, I'd probably go with Hollywood Brown. I really, really like Hollywood Brown, and I'd feel a lot better about that configuration there, getting Hollywood Brown uh, and then waiting on Gardner Minshew as my quarterback too and having uh, my flex, my second flex spot be a toss-up between Kirk, Lindsey, Deontay Johnson, Deshaun Jackson on a weekly basis. So that would be the one mistake I would say I probably made here. Um, otherwise, I, I, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Um, I hope you got some valuable information from it. I feel like this is one of my better mock drafts in a while. If you all want to do this, of course, again, you all could just go on Google, type in Fantasy Pros Mock Draft Simulator. It'll pop up completely free to use. Uh, and again, if you all want to support the brand, the best way to do that is to go cop the draft guide, which is going to help you out incredibly for your 2020 fantasy football season. Sign up on monkeyknifefight.com. Use the, the promo code BDGE when you deposit 10 bucks or more play a game on their website. Once you play a game, that's when they get no they notify me and I give you access to the guide. So just for further instructions, you'll get access to our season long draft guide, Dr. Morse's injury guide, our rookie dynasty guide, plus $20 to play with on Monkey Knife Fight. And inside our guide, I mean there's so many exclusive articles and videos that will go live July 1st, plus the Big Dog's Bible. It's it's my it's the Bible that I write up every year. It's exactly how to attack your fantasy football draft. It's got all of our rankings. It's got fucking everything in there. I love y'all. I'm out. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. And I'll see y'all tomorrow. Oh, no. I, I, I was not on bunk bed breakdowns this week. So y'all see Mike and Noah tomorrow. Love y'all.